Hello and welcome to Beacon Church online service. This is a shortened extract of our previous service which we are now holding at the Watergate Centre in Whitchurch. Uh, we will continue to provide uh, these online service uh, segments. But you're very welcome to come and join us uh, in Whitchurch at the Watergate Centre. Uh, you would need to let us know in advance to sign up because of the current Covid regulations but we do look forward to seeing you soon. Who 
beside you, you open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. first reading are some verses from Romans chapter 7 beginning at verse 15. I do not understand what I do for what I want to do I do not do but what I hate I do. I have the desire to do what is good but I cannot carry it out for I do not do the good I want to do but the evil I do not want to do this I keep on doing. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. The second reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 25. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, 
drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Amen. So, do you recognise that? Those of you who have seen uh, Louis Giglio's Indescribable may remember that photograph there, and you'll remember that it's actually a photograph of planet Earth. That's it, in case you didn't uh, recognise it immediately. Um, the story behind this photograph is that on the 14th of February, 2000, uh, 1990, Voyager 1 was just about to leave uh, our solar system, and it was asked by the uh, scientists at NASA to turn around and take a photograph of the solar system before it left. And so this is Earth from 3.7 billion miles away, and it makes us feel incredibly small, doesn't it? Um, in one way, it makes us feel incredibly small, but in another way, it makes us feel incredibly privileged because the God of this whole universe who created a hundred billion galaxies in our universe is actually interested in us. And I love what it says in Psalm 113 there. It says the Lord is exalted over the nations. Um, who is like the Lord our God? Who, the one who sits enthroned on high. He stoops down to look at the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes. He's so interested in us. Isn't that incredible? This huge God is interested and wants to lift us out of the dust heap and seat us with princes. And uh, obviously, he sent his only son as a measure of just how much he loves us. Let's remind ourselves quickly of the story. God wanted uh, his love. He wanted fellowship. And so he created human beings, you and me, for fellowship with himself. But he didn't want to create robots or automatons, people who had no choice but to love him. So he gave us choice. He gave us free will. And the way he did this was to put in the Garden of Eden this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said to man, to Adam and Eve, you can eat of any tree in this whole garden. But that one tree, would you mind just not eating of that tree? If you, if you eat of that tree, you will die. Uh, and that's the way I know that you'll be choosing to have relationship and fellowship with me. Just don't eat of that tree. Simple. Unfortunately, we know what happened. The s Satan, the serpent, deceived them. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And on that day, they died spiritually. It took another 900 or years or so to die physically, but they died spiritually on that day. And do you know what? That had a sort of cataclysmic sort of ra ramifications on the universe. The whole, uh, it's what we call the fall. And everyone died. Every Every baby born on planet Earth since that moment was born spiritually dead. Let me explain that. Here is my grandfather 98 years ago, uh, just outside St. Paul's Covent Garden, getting married. Uh, and uh, he's a lucky man to be standing there because just a few years before, he was in the Battle of the Somme. And on that particular field, he was wounded in the leg. If the trajectory of that bullet had just been a fraction different, he could have been killed and uh, like his his brother-in-law was and that's his grave in Les Tables. but uh, but if my granddad had been killed then my dad wouldn't have been born and I wouldn't have been born and my children wouldn't have been born and my grandchildren wouldn't have been born we would all have died on that field in northern France back there in 1916 so we, are, we would have all died in my grandfather. And that's what it means physically. So sort of translate that spiritually and understand why we all died with Adam spiritually at that moment. Um, that's what theologians call, they call that um, total depravity. <laughs> it just affects the totality of the universe because Adam chose to sin, Adam and Eve chose to sin. Um, have you ever noticed that children don't need encouraging to be bad? Uh, when my brother was three years old, he found a razor blade and he came to me and he very kindly slashed my knee with the razor blade. A few years later, he found a box of matches and so he lit a fire under his bed using the box of matches. 
Um, I must admit, I wasn't entirely blameless myself. Uh, there was a time when I was playing with my brother on a sledge. It was a lovely snowy day. It was my turn, clearly, and uh, he had been on the sledge far too long. He wasn't getting off, so I went to the tool shed, and I found the heaviest uh, claw hammer that I could find, and I whacked him on the back with it, and that got him off the sledge really quickly. See, we were bad kids. No one taught us. It just kind of came naturally to us. And my sister will tell you that, yes, indeed, they were very bad. She was bad as well, by the way. You're all bad. You know, you were all bad. Because we were born, the very millisecond we were born, we were born needing a savior because we were born spiritually dead. That's why Paul says in Colossians 2, says when we were dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of our flesh, God made us alive in Christ. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus in, in John 3, didn't he? You must be born again. You must be born again. And you may say, yes, I remember that day when I was born again. Uh, I was saved. And now I'm destined for heaven. And I would agree with you. You were saved. You are destined for heaven. But I'm not sure, actually, about that word saved fully. Because actually, it's a bit of a yes and a no. Because yes, you were saved in one sense, in your spirit, but in your soul, you really have got a lot of salvation that yet needs to be done. So let me just explain that. We are a tripartite being, a bit like God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We also have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. We're tripartite. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And our spirits are saved. And love this in Hebrews 10.10, 10, we have been made holy. You know, Paul says in Ephesians 2, doesn't he, we, he, God has raised us up with Christ and seated us in heavenly places. You know, we are eternally secure in that sense. We're saved. Our spirits are safe. But this writer to the Hebrews, just four verses later, seems to have a change of heart and talks about those who are being made holy. Why is he suddenly changing from have been to are being? Because he's changed his focus to talk about from the spirit to the soul. We are being made holy. And that's why Paul says in Philippians that we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because we're working out on the cold face of our mind, our will, and our emotions, our salvation. And it'll take a lifetime. I don't think we'll ever get there, actually, until we see Jesus. Uh, 1 John 3, 2, when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's a lifetime's work. And then, of course, our bodies will be saved at the resurrection of the dead, 1 Corinthians 15. Our bodies will be raised to live, live forever. But it's the salvation of our souls that freedom in Christ is all about. And it's a process that we call sanctification, being made like Christ. If you like, becoming more transparent so that what's actually going on in us, in our spirit, becomes more actually transparent and more visible to people. Um, which is one way of putting it, isn't it? But it does take a lifetime. Why is it important? Firstly, for our joy. If you remember, our soul is where the, our emotions are. So as we become more sanctified, our emotions will be more filled with joy. Psalm uh, 16 verse 11 says that, you know, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I love what Peter says, 1 Peter 5. He actually says, though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of of your souls. So this joy, this inexpressible and glorious joy is linked with us becoming more and more sanctified in our souls. So that's a real incentive, isn't it, to press into sanctification because we want more joy in our lives. And you sometimes meet these old saints, don't you, who are sort of 80, 90 years old, and they're just, they may be physically a bit crumbly, but actually in their, in their souls, they're joyful, you know, because they become more and more like Christ. And it just shines through them. I'm sure we all have met people like that. So we just think the love of Christ and the joy of Jesus is on these people. Um, secondly, though, we need to be sanctified for the world. St. Francis of Assisi said this, sanctify yourself and you'll sanctify society. Because spiritual salvation is invisible, but actually the salvation of our souls is visible to other people around us. You know, we have influence. 
Sociologists tell us, don't they, that even the most introverted person will influence 10,000 people uh, during the course of their lifetime. We have influence. We're all leaders in that sense. And um, this is something lovely that Blaise Pascal said, the serene beauty of a holy life is the most powerful influence in the world next to the power of God. So as we allow God to sanctify our souls, we have this influence which draws people to God. That's why Jesus said the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples. He didn't say make converts. Making converts is great. Get their spirits saved, get them to heaven, but actually make disciples of them you know, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and you'll see a salvation of their souls. You know, you'll see them being sanctified and changed in their minds and their wills and their emotions. So it's a battle, and it takes tremendous effort. And we have to battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And this is where freedom in Christ comes in. Last week, Dave was talking very well, brilliantly, about our battle against the world. If you remember, he talked about our battle with this tendency to acquisition, to sexual promiscuity, this need for celebrity status, and we, you know, brilliant discussion about the world. We're now going on to the flesh. So I want to, like Dave, give you three words, habits, household, and holiness. So habits. I like the saying, be careful of your thoughts, for your thoughts become your words. Be careful of your words, for your words become your actions. Be careful of your actions, your actions become your habits. Be careful of your habits, your habits become your character. Be careful of your character, your character becomes your destiny. So it starts with the thought life. How can we guard our thoughts? Well, we have to guard our input. Um, Frankly, binge watching Netflix or soaps, or we have to be careful of the people that we're mixing with. We have to guard our hearts. Proverbs 4:23: Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. So we have to just be people who watch what actually goes into our thoughts. Our, our brain is like a brilliant computer. You know, we have to be careful how we program this computer that we've been given. Uh, of our brains, our hearts, if you like, who we are. We've got to be careful. What goes in will come out. Um, secondly, our words. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So let's try and get into our lives as much of the word of God, the truth, as we can by regular Bible reading, by listening to teaching tapes, by reading biographies and autobiographies. You know, that's a fantastic way of being inspired. Christian books aren't the best sort of liter lit literary in the world. They're not sort of the best grammar and syntax and everything, but, but tremendous truths can come through Christian books, biographies and autobiographies. So you think, my goodness, how inspiring is that? You know, reading the autobiography of, of these people or the biography of Hudson Taylor or C.T. Studd absolutely changed my life, you know, when I was a young Christian. So let's be inspired. Let's get into our word, into our hearts, as much truth as we can. Habits. Aristotle, we are what we do repeatedly. <laughs> we are what we do repeatedly. Therefore, excellence is a habit. Now, I know you're all budding neuroscientists, but people say that neurons that fire together weave together. And there's something about doing something repeatedly that makes it easier and easier and easier. And they're linked to actions so that your actions become easier the more you just get used to doing them. It's a bit like taking a machete and hacking your way through a jungle. It's really, really tough the first time. But the second time, it's a bit easier. And then after a week, much easier. You just walk through this path that you've made through the jungle. My worry is after COVID, after a year of... Uh, of not being in church, that actually this jungle path is getting a bit overgrown again. We need to get out of machetes and start clearing the path again. Get these habits going again. You know, but we need to develop these habits. Um, habits of being uh, coming to church, coming to connect group, of actually you know, these wonderful habits, godly habits of prayer and worship. So these things are important. Your habits become your character, Character is a Greek word that actually means it's a stamping tool. It's something that engraves. It's the distinctive mark that you leave on the world. It's what your legacy will be for the generations after you. It's how people talk about you when they're not with you. That's your character. It's your stamping tool, your distinctive mark. Have you got into the habit of worrying? 
Have you got in the habit of anxiety? Have you got into the habit of, of just speaking negatively? Have you got into the habit of angry words? Have you got into the habit of, uh, of just temper, losing your temper? See, these things can all be habits. There are two things that uh, can be said of changing our habits, the two heresies. One is that change is easy, and the other one is that change is impossible. Change is easy, it's not. You know, actually, it's often through suffering that our character gets changed. It's in that crucible of suffering that God will, will bring out the gold of our lives, will purify the gold in the crucible of suffering. It's said, isn't it, that God is more interested in your character than in your happiness. And some people just go through a lot of suffering because that is what God is drawing out of their lives, incredible gold, really pure things. So we're never promised not to have suffering in our lives, but we are promised that God will draw out of us beautiful character that will really give him glory. And the second thing is that change is impossible. You may say, I can't help the way that I feel. That's who I am. But actually, no, you can help the way that you feel. If you remember that uh, hierarchy of spirit, soul, and body, the spirit is you. That's you. Your soul is just what you have. It's your emotions, your mind, and your will. It's not you. That's just what you have. Your body is where you live. But actually, you can take control of your emotions, your mind, and your will. You can take yourself by the ear, and you can say, do this, like David did. Often, he would say, be lifted up, O my soul. Or he would say in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. This was the spirit of David speaking firmly to his emotions and his mind and his will. So we have authority. There's a hierarchy here. We can grab ourselves by the ear and jolly well tell ourselves, you know, be lifted up. You know, there's, there's no need for you to be feeling so down. And we can take control even of the most ingrained strongholds of our thinking. A man called Ed Silvoza, who's an Argentinian evangelist, said this, a spiritual stronghold, I love this, is a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that causes us to accept as unchangeable something that we know is contrary to the will of God. Isn't that fantastic? What an incredible definition. And you know what scripture says? It says the weapons of our warfare have divine power to demolish strongholds. I love that. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. So these strongholds can come down, and they come down through developing these habits of getting into the word, of prayer, fellowship, you know, of worship. All these things can bring these strongholds in our character down. Next word is household. And these get much quicker. Um, household, Galatians talks about the household of faith, and Paul in Ephesians talks about us being members of God's household. It's fellowship that we're talking about. Now, John Tyson, who's an Australian pastor, said this, I'm basically convinced that without a shared rule of life based on tangible practices, discipleship won't happen in a Western context. Radical individualism and consumerism are simply too overwhelming as seductive forces for individual Christians to resist. Isn't that an incredible saying? I, thought, I think that's so profound. Radical individualism. We live in a culture where, which reduces life to one, me. It's my rights that matter. It's my desires that matter. That is what our culture yells at us. You know, how are we going to escape from the radical influence of that by being in fellowship, by being uh, committed? And it is a matter of being committed. Uh, Dora prayed for uh, cell group leaders, for, for small group leaders earlier. I was just so blessed by that, Dora. Thank you. Because it's tough being a, a small group leader. And I know what happens. You know, you spend hours preparing for your small group. You, you spend time in prayer preparing for your small group. You get excited. You, you advertise and remind people on social media. You prepare the venue, you know, and then they don't turn up. And you keep smiling. And you sort of pretend that you're really happy inside. But actually inside, you're getting pretty discouraged. And that discouragement can lead to burnout. And burnout of ministry can lead to burnout of a church. You know, but if you are a small group leader, can I just say, don't let defeats defeat you. Don't let defeat defeat you. Find your joy in God because he loves you and he's watching you. 
Habakkuk 3.17, though the fig tree doesn't bud, though the grapes on the vine, there's no grapes on the vine and the olive crop fails, field, the fields produce no food, no sheep in the pen and no cattle in stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in my salvation. You know, we can find joy in God even when we're not finding it through what we're doing. But as for the rest of us, you know, I know that we all have families, commitments, we have work commitments, you know, we, we have extended families and we have got many reasons why we simply can't make our groups. But just let them know, would you just apologise, you know, just say I'm really sorry, but, you know, whatever. Because sometimes it's just that something more advantageous to me comes up and I just don't go because it's to my advantage to do this other thing. Well, actually, Psalm 15 says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent or who may live on your holy mountain? The one who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. Sorry, this is a prior engagement. It's on my calendar. And I'm sorry, I'd love to go to that party, but I've got a prior engagement here. And uh, it's something that I actually have to honor God with. So let's be people who, who really are loyal. It's not something that the world thinks much of, but the, the, the Lord values loyalty in that way. Um, why is it important to be committed? Because we want to be accountable. And um, I don't know if you know that expression, knocking the rough edges off. That is actually a, a biblical word, knocking the rough edges off. It's diatriben. It's in Greek. Uh, and it means um, rubbing against or rubbing away. John 3, 22, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he diatriben. He rough, knocked the rough edges off them. And that's what happens when we're in, decide when we're, we're being accountable to one another. We get the rough edges knocked off us. That's how we become rounded characters. So it's important. Um, Chloe and I were on the School of Leadership the other week, came across this Johari's window, which was fascinating. Um, each of us has an open areas of our lives that we know about, everyone knows about, very open. Then we have hidden areas where it's actually my secret. You don't know a thing about this, but I do. And then we have areas that I don't know about and you don't know about. But then very embarrassingly, we have areas that we don't know anything about, but you know all about. You know, and these are the sort of character faults that we have that everyone is intensely aware of, but actually you're not really aware of them, are you? And that's quite embarrassing, particularly as a leader, you know, that you may have these glaring faults in your character that everyone kind of talks about, but actually no one lets you know. But, you know, we've got to be vulnerable, open to one another if we're going to shrink this area here, the blind area. So let's be people who get the blind area shrunk by being vulnerable, by being open to one another as we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7. As he in the light, we have fellowship and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. And the consequences of this body as it grows. You know, Jesus said, as he, as he only gave one new commandment, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples and we'll see growth, it'll be known. You know, Paul talks about the body being, you know, you can be a foot or a hand or an eye or an ear. You know, let's be people who represent, when we come together, the body of Christ. So people on Whitchurch High Street, so don't say, why is that eye attached to a foot and dragging itself down the high street? You know, let's be a whole body. Let's be together. Let's be functioning together in that sort of cohesive way so that we represent not a sort of fragmented jigsaw pieces that no one's quite sure what this is. You know, what is Beacon? It's a jigsaw piece here and a jigsaw piece there. Let's be a, a coherent picture of the body of Christ. So people will look at us and say, yeah, that's beautiful. That's Jesus. What a powerful body that is, the body of Jesus Christ. As we dwell together in unity, God commands blessing. So Jesus' prayer, I pray they may be one, that the, that, that, that the world may know that you sent me. And the final word is holiness. And uh, uh, this is... Um, this is the bit that Janet just read out at the end of this great diatribe in Romans 7 where Paul was kind of just being frustrated. How can I overcome this sinful nature that I've got? You know, this soul that keeps tending towards bad things. You know, how can I defeat this nature? He said, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Glory, it's the Holy Spirit working in us. And then Janet also read out this, so walk by the Spirit and you're not gratified the desires of the flesh. And I love that word, walk. 
Because the Holy Spirit is a person. You know, he's not a force like electricity. He's a person. We walk with him. And as we walk with him, not grieving him or quenching him or resisting him, but just walking side by side, fellowshipping, we say, don't we, may the, may, the, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a specialist in fellowship, and he wants to fellowship with us. So let's do everything we can to just fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And as we do, Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit as we fellowship with him. Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled, continuous present, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the fruits of the Spirit come, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. These things grow in us as we walk with the Holy Spirit. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, do you ask, you know, actually 1 Corinthians 14 says, eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, eagerly desire them. Do you ask the Holy Spirit, I want to eagerly desire, would you give me words of knowledge, words of wisdom, would you give me faith, would you give me gifts of healing, miraculous powers even, would you give me prophecy, the distinguishing between spirits, speaking in tongues, would you give me that gift, would you give me interpretation of tongues, we should be asking the Holy Spirit for these gifts and as we do, you know, we'll see the whole body built up and edified, so we will fail, we will fail. Um, Dora quoted Micah earlier on in the service. I want to quote Micah again. Micah 7, 8. It's one of my favorite scriptures. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I fall, I will arise. We all trip up. We all fail. All of us do. But then there's 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just 1 John 1, 9 it. <laughs> you know, and, he will just, and, and just confess one or two sins that you can think about and the whole lot gets deleted. If you confess to sins, he's faithful and just forgives our sins and, and, and then cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Like he presses the reset button and all of your unrighteousness gets deleted if you just confess the sins that you can remember. So let's be people who keep clean, keep in fellowship, keep filled with the Holy Spirit and be, uh, as we have habits, as we keep in the household of faith and as we walk with the Holy Spirit, we'll overcome the flesh. I wanted to finish with this picture of planet earth again and i just wanted to, to finish with this one verse from john the baptist he must grow greater how is that possible but i must grow less i think what it's saying here is it's our revelation of who god is this god who stands outside of time above the universe he has to stoop down to look at the universe the, the hundred billion galaxies he has to stoop down to look at them he's inside us He's living inside of us, and he's intensely interested in everything that goes on. So let him grow greater in our understanding, our revelation of who he is, and let me grow less. I just want to become more transparent for you, Lord Jesus.